Right now, a lot of people are trying Rust out, and there is a lot of difficulty. I mean, the memes for the Borrow Checker are incredible. Don't be a meme, okay? This video is going to help you not be a meme by showing you some TypeScript and then how to do it in Rust, hopefully to demystify how the Borrow Checker works. Now, before we begin, I do make the basic assumption that you have programming experience, meaning that this is truly a tutorial for people who know TypeScript well. So none of this should even surprise you up here. You can see, okay, this is the main function. This is the entry point. Okay, I'm creating a list of one, two, three. Yeah, maybe some concepts aren't directly familiar coming from the TypeScript only world, but you get the concept. I have a variable that equals this. And of course, you're advanced enough to be able to read this error and realize you made a huge mistake by not subscribing to me. Check the comments down below. Everyone will tell you how much easier it is to understand the borrow checker if you are subscribed. So let's start off with this simple TypeScript example. Effectively, all I'm going to do is just print out an array of numbers. I'm going to create the array right here, and then I'm going to print it out twice passing in that array. Now, this may seem like pretty benign code, but the identical code in Rust actually does not compile. So this is a good time to talk about a couple things that you need to know. In Rust, there are such things as values. And in this case, item holds on to the value of a vector 1, 2, 3. You can think of a vector almost identical as you would, say, a list in JavaScript. Now, the thing in Rust is that there can only be one value holder. So when I hand this value to the function print out item, that function now is the owner of the value, which means that when I hand it out a second time, that value is gone. The function had it, it used it, it did nothing with it, it's gone, the list is gone. That's why you can see something right here that says value moved here, use of moved value. Those errors are pretty clear what's happened. So that leads us to our second kind of type of value. I can put an ampersand right here, and that means I'm going to refer to a value, not actually be the owner of the value. I'll be the owner of this specific reference to that value. I can go down here, and I can hand out these two references. Now, the thing about these references is they're called immutable references. They have handed out a reference in which somebody else can hold on and look to the values, but they may not mutate it in any any way. So this vector is effectively constant at this point. And you can see, because I can go like this, item dot push, you know, five. And it's going to tell you, sorry, you cannot borrow this thing as mutable. It's immutable. So now we have made this effectively identical to the TypeScript version, in which instead of passing in the value, we pass in a reference to that value. This is also referred to as borrowing. So that is why it's called the borrow checker. It checks who is borrowing what, whether they're borrowing it immutably or mutably. Now, if you like Rust and TypeScript, check out these guys at Chisel Strike. It's a Rust code base that allows you to use TypeScript to define your data model and your business logic and security policies and have a fully functional REST API for you. No database management. It's all done with their own version of SQLite and it's no hassle and it's all open source. So go check out their Rust foo and give them a star on GitHub. And if you want a fully managed solution, you can sign up for their beta right now for free with your GitHub account at chiselstrike.com. All right, back to the Rust. All right, so the second thing that we're going to look at is this right here. So we create a class that's called foo. We have an array of three foos. And then I'm going to grab the last item out of the array. Then I'm going to pop that item out of the array. And then I'll log out that last item. Now, this looks like a pretty kind of normal case you've seen in JavaScript before, where you refer to something in an array. And then the array eventually gets mutated. But you still hold on to that value or a reference to that value. Now, this works because JavaScript keeps track of who holds on to what and only deletes things once nobody holds on to them anymore. This is commonly referred to as garbage collection. So when I jump over to my Rust example, you just see errors and everything blown up everywhere and you don't understand why. Let's walk through why. Well, first off, I do the same thing. I create an array list of foos. Then I hold on to the last item in the list. Then I pop. Then I try to print out the last item in the list. So what's effectively happening right here is that we have a immutable reference to an item within the list. That means we're referring to a value. That means I could technically take this value and print it right here, and it's not a problem. We could see that value being the third foo. So if we had some sort of way to identify that this was a third foo, you'd see it within that print statement. But then we mutate the vector. So what am I referring to? Am I referring to the last spot in the vector that no longer exists? Who holds on to that value? There is no garbage collector. There is nothing that manages all the objects for you. Instead, you manage 
who owns the object. Just like in our previous example that there was a value, nobody holds on to that value anymore. Only you hold on to a reference to that value. And that's very problematic. And how Rust catches that is by not allowing a immutable reference at the exact same time you have a mutable reference out. A mutable reference, of course, meaning that vector.pop requires a mutable reference to vector such that they can mutate the inner state. But if you want to see something funny, if I delete this last line, all the warnings go away. And the reason being is that Rust was able to tell I have an immutable reference up until this point, and then I only have a mutable reference out. So long as I don't refer to last foo again after this point, it will not give me an error. That's because I've obeyed the most important rule about the Rust borrow checker. I may have a mutable reference or immutable references, but not both at the same time. All right, so let's look at this third example. So right here, I'm creating a foo that has a value that's incremented every time I new one up. I'm gonna reverse and then print an array. I'll create that array, and then I've called reverse and print twice. For those that don't know what happened, effectively, we did reverse the array, but then we re-reversed our reverse. Now, what makes this so difficult for a lot of people, in JavaScript, there's a series of methods that both do something and return an array. Some of them mutate, some of them copy. A good example would be foo.map. Map copies and creates a new array. Foo.reverse does not copy, but returns out the array. Now, for those that are very experienced, they already know all these rules. Okay, sorts in place, reverses in place, uh, map and filter are copies, right? You like know these things intrinsically, but for all the people that are new, they don't know this. And everybody has to go through the process of learning by error eventually. Now, this does not even exist in Rust, and let me show you. So I tried to create the exact same version. Now remember, we already learned this in our first lesson. I'm taking in a reference to a vector, and then I'm calling an iterator, and I'm reversing it, and then printing it each out. My value is right here, owned by the variable vector, and then I just pass a reference into each one of these. Now for me to recreate exactly what happened before, I would have to call reverse on the vector. So let's go over here and go like this, foo, reverse. Now, reverse does happen, but look at what the documentation says right here. It requires a mutable reference. So let's just try to call this. It's going to say, hey, you can't do that. You can't borrow foo as mutable because it's behind an immutable reference, meaning that if I were to erase this, make this immutable, I would then be able to actually mutate in place foo, reverse, mutate that, then iter, then go down to the bottom and mute, mute. And of course, you also have to declare the variable as mutable itself. Now, what this has done is it's clearly told you what's going to happen. Reverse and print will mutate your vector to be reversed and to be printed. Whereas with this example, it's not necessarily clear, nor unless if you have experience with reverse, is it obvious. So this is what is making people so excited about Rust. I know some of you saw that and thought, oh gosh, I would never want to do that. But at the same time, you do have to admit the fact that you can know when something gets mutated and doesn't get mutated does just completely cross off an entire set of bugs. And the reality is that immutability used everywhere often can slow down a system. You can see chunks while scrolling. You can feel these garbage collection bad moments happening, especially on something like mobile. So it's not always the answer just to make a copy of everything. So hopefully this helps you really understand the borrow checker in a more complete way. Thank you so much for watching. Again, please like the video, hit the subscribe button, and take the chance to, you know, try out Rust. Advent of Code is happening right now at the end of the 2022. It's amazing. A really great problems for rust. The name is the primogen.